So what I want to do is talk to you about the human story as, um, as Dan uh, mentioned. I want to talk a little bit and go from the sort of general to the specific. Talk, talk about our adaptation choices um, and as my, the title that was given to me, um, we need more than just technical fixes um, to deal with this problem. Um, in many ways, extremes are magnifying glasses for the vulnerabilities that we as a society already have and that will just be exposed through more of them. And so I want to talk a little bit about and, and show you some empirical uh, data about the gap between what is needed in terms of responding to all these extremes that you saw today and what's actually happening. Uh, I'm going to draw on some studies that I've done uh, and I think Juliet Hart and uh, folks from Sea Grant are still here. I'm going to show you just a couple of uh, uh, early results from a survey we, we've done in coastal communities here in California just to look at, you know, what are they doing? Are they already preparing for this? Are they thinking about these issues? Where are they in the process? Um, and get a little bit at, you know, what motivated them to start it. Was it these extreme events, some experiences like this or not? Um, and what is in the way? And then actually go a little bit more into that through case study that I've um, done with my postdoc, uh, Julia Ekstrom, on adaptation in five communities in the San Francisco Bay. And if I forget it later, ask me about San Francisco Airport and whether we can just make those dikes around the airport higher. Um, Anyway, and then actually we'll report also on work that Ruth Langridge and her colleagues at UC Santa Cruz have done on adaptation of small water utilities. We've heard quite a bit here so far about the big dams and, and reservoirs, but what about those smaller ones that don't get water from the Sierra? So here are some examples of options um, that we have, and these are just a small sample. We have hundreds and hundreds of adaptation options. This is the, the set of structural or technical ones. Um, and I'm not going to speak about them in, in uh, detail, just to say, well, and then there's the policy and planning tools. There are financial mechanisms that we can use, and then there's a whole bunch of informational or behavioral interventions, ranging from education, disaster preparedness, decision support, like what Costa was um, uh, presenting to us, or you know, warning systems, and so on and so forth. The point that I want to make here is, first of all, we already have a tool set, a toolbox, that is much broader than just structural technical fixes. Thank goodness. Um, the second point about this is that if you want to do the structural technical things, you will need everything else to make it happen, right? If you want to change, let's say, uh, I'll take the example of the airport, if you want to just heighten the seawalls or the, the revetments around the airport, well, that would mean, first of all, that you're going to, if you build a dike higher, you need a broader base. If you build that onto the runway, it's not long enough anymore to have the airplanes go. So where, where do you go? You go into the bay. The bay is protected by law from being filled. So if you want to have a structural solution, you need a policy change first so that you can make that happen. Well, that has a whole bunch of reasons why we have those laws, right? We want to protect the ecology and the beauty and all the rest of it of that. So these are not so simple. If you want to do that, it's incredibly expensive. The people at the airport that we interviewed for the study in the, in the San Francisco Bay basically said it is virtually unaffordable. What, the kind of, if we're talking about a 1.4 meter sea level rise and the expansion of the airport area, it's beyond the means that they have. Where's it going to come from? Well, anyway, the point is even if you want to implement structural measures, you need a lot more to make that happen. Now, what are we trying to achieve with adaptation? And I, I'm using here a picture that comes out of this recently released um, IPCC report, the Extremes Report. Um, in which I was a review editor. And what I want to point to, and I don't have a little thingy, or do I have one? Yes, I do. Um, what you see here is this is the risk we're facing, and what you heard a lot about today is this piece here, weather and climate events and how they will change. Whether or not there is a disaster risk is, depends on what's at risk, what's in harm's way. That's the first thing. The second thing is, Whatever is at risk, how sensitive is it? If it's going to be hit, how important or how uh, severe is that uh, impact going to be? And can that system, that entity, that community, that person deal with it? If they are not as, if they're not 
particularly vulnerable, they might be exposed, but then maybe their risk is not all that high. But if vulnerability is high, you don't need necessarily a very big event to create a, a pretty dangerous situation. So what we want to do in many ways is get whatever is in harm's way out of harm's way. That's one important goal we want to pursue. A second one is to reduce the vulnerability, and that is to reduce that sensitivity and increase people, systems, response, capacity. Costa's work is a good example of how you can do that by building in more flexibility into your system. Improving disaster risk management so that if something happens, you actually can respond more effectively, more quickly, rebuild more quickly. Those are important th things. And then to the extent that you, know, you don't get necessarily to um, the, the communities or to the systems uh, in time, you want to make sure that the systems that are being affected have greater resilience. And what that really means is that they're able to self-organize, to bounce back faster, and to learn and change. You're not going to be able to maintain everything we have in the exact same shape. You also have to change over time so that essentially you still get the functions. And then there's, of course, um, ultimately that if we do actually experience a disaster, that we spread the risk. Insurance mechanisms is one thing we heard about earlier today. And finally, the, the ultimate adaptation option actually is mitigation. If we do not do that extensively, this will be a lot harder to do on the adaptation side. Now, this is going to be my most complicated picture here today, and then it gets into photos and nice little histograms and going to be a lot easier. What I want to show you here is that this is the historical range. You've seen that now uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of times. But really what a sort of you know, general distribution of events um, or of any variable really hides is a lot of variability Year to year. You've seen that all the time. What, you, what I want to bring your attention to is the two lines sort of that embrace that variability. In the social sciences, it's what we call the coping range. It is basically the range within which we can deal with cold and the heat. You know, we have air conditioners, we have adopted all kinds of mechanisms to deal with that variability. Now, that variability, that, that range can change for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with climate. Um, say it becomes smaller because we have an economic crisis, for example. So we don't have enough resources to deal with that, right? That would be one possibility how the coping range changes while the variability might just stay at the same level. It's going to get a lot harder to deal with that because a lot of the events start to s stick out on the side that we can't cope with anymore, okay? Here is one scenario where the coping range increases. Say we make adaptation a priority and policy, and we increase the resources that we put into preparedness and response. That would be great. So even if the extremes on the physical side become a little bit more um, vigorous, as we've seen today, we're okay, okay? It's still in the range of the societally accepted risk. And then there is the sort of possibility here um, that our coping range through adaptation has to move into a whole different range. Um, we might no longer, as in this case here, try to deal with, say, cold extremes because they become rarer. Um, we might focus our intention on really being prepared for dealing with more heat, just as, as one example, right? So this is basically when these kinds of curves that you've seen shift um, a number of times today, what we would have to do as a society to be able to deal with that, okay? Now, let me then take you into the empirical here. This was all the conceptual prelims. Um, this is one of the results from um, the uh, survey that Juliet Hart and, and I and others have led on uh, basically looking at coastal, this, the results here are only coastal communities and counties along the entire San Francisco coast, open ocean and bay side coast. And we asked them where they are in the adaptation process. And we basically gave them four basic options and then we got into a little bit more detail, which I'm not gonna show you here. But what we first found is that about 10% of the responding um, communities and, and counties had not yet started to think about adaptation at all. About 40% said, well, we're starting to think about it and trying to see what's going on. 
what is the risk that we're facing? That is a huge increase over um, a study I did five years ago when there were just about literally a half a dozen of communities in all of California who had started to think about it. So significant increase. Um, just about the same number of, of communities basically said they're in the planning stage and, and quite frankly a very early planning stage where they're just thinking about well what might we do about this. But we'll come back to that in a minute of why they haven't gone much further and then as you'll see someone pick up the phone please. 9% um, um, had uh, started with doing actually something on the ground. So. A large number of the communities are essentially in the early stages of beginning to think about adaptation. What got them started about this? Now, let me um, first of all say that there are a lot of different reasons people had for starting. And I want to point to this one first. A recent extreme event. It's the thing that motivated them the least. Interesting, huh? You would think that would be the thing that just always kicks the people into gear and, and gets them going. Well, maybe it's because we haven't had any recently in the last three, four years or something that that wasn't the kicker. Um, but it's actually not entirely surprising to me based on sort of the 20 years of research that I've done where that's actually often the case. In, a, in the moment when you are faced with an extreme event, all that matters after that is what? Back to normal to what you did before, it's not the moment when you start thinking, oh, what should we do about these risks as they change, you know, in a, in a dramatic way. Um, it's, it's often sort of a background noise on that one. What seems to be more important is that they were busy having development of a climate action plan or they're updating their general plan, coastal plan, or um, they actually got some information that was pertinent to them, or in this case here, Thank goodness, the climate adaptation strategy in 2009 made a difference. This is very nice to hear. The important thing here to, to uh, how to read this is that this is where the money is. You know, when you do a climate action plan, you get money from EPA or from, you know, NASA or from somebody, right, from ABAG or, or something, uh, MTC. If you um, have a general plan update, well, that's a big budget item in a local budget. A huge budget item. I don't know if you're aware of that. Hundreds of thousands of dollars go into a general plan update. That's a great time to add in the climate element. But just to do adaptation planning just for the heck of it, just as sort of, you know, to just do something, that's just not what these people have time for. So very important to sort of think about these opportunities of planning and policy as this is when adaptation planning will happen. Now, you can't see this very well. I'm going to walk you through it. But what you basically see here, we asked um, people to identify, so how come you're not doing more, um, even if you have started? What was a hurdle? What was in your way? And what you see in red are the things that were really big hurdles, in yellow, the things that are small hurdles, and in green, things that weren't really all that important. And the top three things are insufficient staff resources to analyze and answer relevant information. In other words, we don't even have enough people to look at what might be coming down the pike. Okay? They don't even have time to think about that. Um, the second one is currently pressing issues are all-consuming. And the third one is lack of funding from regional, state, and or federal agencies to prepare a plan. In other words, not even to just build that seawall or to, to you know, increase that revetment. It's to even start to think about it and plan what we're going to do. They don't have money for it. So those are the big three hurdles and then a huge drop to things like, you know, there is lack of public demand. We don't have enough technical know-how or assistance. One of the things I always like to point out is the science is too uncertain. Not a big deal at least not at this moment, not to get started, not in these very early moments, okay? That is just, I mean, it's not not important, but it's just not an overwhelmingly big issue. The bigger one is we don't have time and money. Let me dig down a little bit into these five regional case studies or uh, local case studies we took. The city of San Francisco, um, a town here called Hayward, uh, and in particular, we looked at something called HASPA, which is the HASPA Shoreline, Hayward Area Shoreline Protection Agency, whatever, it, HASPA, it's a lot easier. Um, Santa Clara County and Marin County. So two cities, two counties, and um, then we also studied the regional process, which is led by four <coughs> regional agencies who are beginning to think about adaptation, and we wanted to see what's happening at that level. 
Um, and so what you're finding now here, if you want to know more, I can tell you later, are sort of the results from the interview studies that we did. Um, but what you find here is the overall frequency of barriers encountered. We basically, this was a stu case study all focused on barriers to adaptation. And the top ranking um, overall uh, the barriers that we found is institutional or governance issues. So the kinds of things that Costa earlier mentioned about, you know, there are legal or institutional demands on why people do what they do, well, they just pretty much run everyone's lives, right? Not just in water management, also in coastal management. Now, what was somewhat surprising to me, but not entirely, is attitudes, values, motivations of people. I find that really important. We always say it's all money, you know, it's all money that matters. But the interesting thing here with these studies is these are actually quite on uh, st uh, studies or cases on the leading edge of adaptation. And what we found here is that it all depends on the people being committed to doing something. If there are people who just think, you know, climate change is just not important, or I don't want to do anything new, I'm not interested in taking a risk, those kinds of attitude, uh, attitudes makes every bit of a difference. Why would it be that way? Well, think about it. They're doing something new. They're not doing what's already in their job descriptions. They're already not, you know, they're, they're, it's not something that they know how to do. If they want to change out of their daily routine, out of their job descriptions, out of their agency missions, if they want to change a law that constrains them, it depends on people doing it. So to the extent that they had or didn't have people or people obstructing it, those kinds of attitudes were incredibly important. And then the third one was money. You know, it goes all the way down here, and I want to just point out here to the last bit, the technical structural issues, just people saying, you know what, we just don't have a technical solution. That wasn't really the issue. It was way ahead of that, all these political, institutional, and people issues that were in the way of making anything else possible. This one here just sort of confirms that. Um, we asked them about, you know, so where is the ultimate source for your problem, for the obstacle that you're facing? And in, in most of the, um, more than half of the, the barriers all went back to either the socioeconomic <coughs> context of that um, community or the governance, the institutional issues. Um, and then again, confirmation of the very important is issue here about the actor. The, the relative unimportant of the system that they were actually concerned with, the, man, the, the system they were um, trying to adapt, is probably because they, the system itself hasn't changed all that much yet, you know? Today's system isn't that dramatically different. They don't have huge questions about that yet. The science isn't dominant yet. That may become much more dominant in the future. Now this piece here is both a good news and bad news um, story, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. So the first thing I wanna, what this here goes back to is, what's the origin of the barrier? Where did it start, both in time and in terms of jurisdiction? Who is responsible for creating the barrier that you faced? And the first thing I want to point out to here um, is that the, the, over, the, the overwhelming majority of um, the barriers actually are locally made. They're homemade. They're not, oh, because the federal government or the state government or somebody else is doing it. They're actually homemade. It's very interesting. It's a, I, I think, in some ways, a good news story in that you have control over that. The other piece that's here is that most of them date back to an earlier time. Now that makes again sense internally if you think about that they have to do with institutions and with people. You know, people's relationship, people's worldviews, people's values, they don't just happen today and <laughs> they go back, um, you know, as long as people pretty much are alive. They don't change all that easily. So again, they might actually be quite um, difficult to change, both the, the, um, the institutional and the people related uh, barriers, if you will. And so it is for that reason that we need external intervention at the local level. Five, yep, okay, I'll move on quite quickly here. Let me quickly then point to um, what helped. Um, what are some of the aids, advantages, or assets um, that helped make a difference? And, and again, the nice thing here is that the personal qualities of the people who are running these efforts, who are really the leaders in their communities, it's the number one asset that people have in communities. And I'm sure you can tell these stories if you've worked with them. 
leadership um, and related uh, policies or, or planning tools, as I mentioned earlier, also very important. This one here, um, I just want to point to, is, is actually um, an interesting one. So when people perceive that, you know, we already have droughts or, you know, not necessarily one recent event, but the experience of droughts or floods or those kinds of things, that does seem to at least help bring it to people's attention or help them imagine what the future might hold. And so it is not unimportant. Strategies to overcome. Policy and management changes is where most of them uh, have happened. Increasing communication. I mean, so many barriers have arisen out of people just not talking to each other. It is almost ridiculous. I mean, we're all stovepipe in policymaking and in, in management as much as in, in our disciplines. So networking and cooperation are very, very important uh, strategies that they are currently pursuing. Let me very quickly move on to this one, which is one more layer down, um, drilling down into one particular barrier, I mean, the, the legal barriers that um, Ruth Langridge and her colleagues looked at. What they did in a very nice set of five case studies is look at small water management agencies, four of them in the northern Monterey Bay, you see them mentioned here around it, um, and one on the north coast in Sonoma County. And the, the key issue here that, that I want to point out to is that these local communities depend on surface water that falls over their over their watershed, basically, or on the groundwater underneath. They don't depend on the Sierra. So forget for the moment anything that's going to happen with what's happening in the, in the Sierras. This is the water that falls right over them. What they did in their study is they looked at um, what are their current problems, basically, you know, the, the hydro geophysical motivations for why you might want to look proactively into what can we do with water shortages. They also looked at um, or found out in their interviews that people seem to also have all kinds of political or legal motivations. In one case, there was a challenge around the Endangered Species Act. In another one, there was some litigation going on. Um, in another case, um, in Soquel Creek uh, Water District, there was an issue of you can't build here anymore unless you come up with some new water resources. So, you know, some development-related moratorium social motivators, sometimes they had strong leadership or drought concerns or whatnot. And so what resulted here is that they looked at a variety of different adaptation strategies, and I want to focus in on the two here that look at drought reserves, which is something of basically uh, recharging the groundwater in their watersheds to make a, or, or to, to have reserves for the dry times. What's interesting about this is that the legal framework for using groundwater and for recharging groundwater is a really complex mess. And it's essentially uncharted territory. Um, what you see here is that there are four parties that have to be involved, um, landowners, city, state, and federal. And at every one of these levels, um, there are different sort of legal bases on which you would have to look at groundwater management, the basis of it. Um, and then finally, the, the last complication um, in this is that you would have to look at the legal framework for where do we store water, what water do we use to recharge, um, how do we get it into the aquifer, Once, you know, what's the legal framework for recharging it, how do we get it back out, or what's the legal framework for getting it back out and then transmitting it to user. None of that is clear at this moment. So even if they think groundwater reserve is a really great idea, they're essentially in complete limbo land. Um, can't really do that. And the, the key unresolved issues is that, first of all, it's not clear what is groundwater. <laughs> now you think that is a weird thing. Legally, it's not defined. And if you can't define it, basically, or if it's not defined, it's not protected. It, you don't know what law to apply. How do you get a permit for something that you don't even know what you're getting a permit for? This is legalese, it's beyond me. But anyway, you, you get the point. It's not defined. So uh, the public trust doctrine is, is an important piece here also, in whether or not it applies. If it does apply to doing this, then groundwater would be much better protected than if it doesn't um, apply. So let me conclude then with these points here. Um, one is, is that, you know, the, the point I made at the beginning that adaptation planning actually is rapidly increasing in the state, both in sectors in these two instances, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm hearing it from the presentations all day. This is going on elsewhere. And yet it is at a very early stage. Um, and there is a huge gap still between what is needed and how much we, or how, how quickly we need to think about these things. 
um, and what's actually happening on the ground. The institutional, including legal barriers and attitudinal barriers, are the dominant ones before everything else. Economic barriers are important, and what I found really interesting is that they matter in the, what are uh, the four richest counties in California are all included in our study, in the case studies, and yet they have made that. They have enormous problems with the economic side of it. The motivations to begin adaptation vary, and extreme events sometimes play a role, but it's really not a dominant one, so don't count on it. Don't, wait, you know, don't, don't you start your talks next time with, oh, we just need another big storm or something, and then they're going to start. It's not necessarily the best approach to start this. Um, there's a significant op opportunity to affect and overcome barriers right in the communities. They are not dependent only on outside assistance, but they do need help with some of them. Um, and then finally, the adaptations that I would say we, we have seen to date are actually the strategies to overcome the barriers. That's what people spend time on. You don't, don't see yet a whole bunch of building or changing a lot of things you know, on the ground. You see a lot of people getting together, talking to each other, starting to build sort of, if you will, the capacity, um, but not really making any change on the ground. So for any questions on coast, I can answer, but Ruth language for water. Thank you.